Welcome to another Trek Yards podcast, guys. This time we are talking games, and not the official ones, uh, but one from the superb modding community, and certainly one of the most popular Star Trek mods out there currently, if not the most popular, Star Trek Armada 3. As it sounds, that is a spiritual successor to Armada's 1 and 2, made using the video game since it was Solar Empire. And today we have joining us project lead and head modeler Max Loaf from the Netherlands. Welcome to the show, Max. Hi guys, pleasure to be here. So first up, I've got to say I'm a huge fan of this mod, and I can easily say I've spent hundreds of hours enjoying your superb work. You've literally just burned through my Saturdays. I mean, Max, come on, what are you doing? Um, a really fantastic game, and I've always loved the continuous improvements that you guys you know, make again and again, and just the pure fun factor is, is just so amazing. I mean, that's what we go for. I mean, we try to deliver the best experience we can. I mean, um, we try to make it look as professional and as mm. fun as possible. Trying to stay within canon with that is hard at times, but mm -hmm. we try yeah. to make it fun. Well, I've played a bit of Armada 3, <laughs> and it looks pretty amazing, uh, but I have yet to master all the controls. I've played a lot of Armadas 1 and 2, and the Fleet Operations mod for Armada 2 in my time. So overall, I'm a huge Armada fan, but I just haven't really got into this new one yet because i just it keeps crashing on my computer and new that's another one. issue <laughs> yeah I mean, how, well, how exactly I mean, how old is this like six seven years old now maybe less than that i mean it's not new anymore stuart terrible i, I think i have the hours for both of us but first question max how did amada 3 actually get started and were you aiming for her to become as, as big as she is today well aiming is not what i'd call it but it was always <laughs> a hope um well, it started out as basically a little pet project. Um, me and uh, another two friends were basically trying to make Sins of a Solar Empire into a Star Trek game. Mm. Started out with a little bit of the Federation, and I mean, at one point it became good enough that we thought, like, you know, let's just put this up on ModDB, see what people think. Um, I mean, initial reaction was slow, but it, I mean, and, uh, it grew. I mean, there was a very big Trek shortage at the time. This was mm. before the 2009 movie, so no real games with exception of a few crappy mobile ones. Um, and eventually people caught on. I mean, um, the only game out then at that point was Star Trek Online, and uh, eventually word spread. Uh, we got people to join us. We got some very talented artists on our team. You've got Michael Wiley, um, which you featured some of the ships mm -hmm. on, uh, on here. Uh, on Polaris here. Class, um, and he's done some exactly. other work. Renegade Battle Cruiser for us as well. Polaris, uh, was at Polaris Mark II was actually designed for Armada 3. <laughs> Um, so, um, and as that grew, we kind of got attention, and there was really, at one point, a really big spike where we got featured on a Reddit post, which really caught on, and from one day we went to having an average of 300 views a day to one day having 20,000 views, um, which was quite a shock to us at that point, and basically after that point, the attention caught on, and uh, we kept growing and growing, yeah, being featured on PC Gamer eventually, and uh, mm. some rather large YouTube channels, including Total Biscuit and NerdCubed, um, which in gaming channels are pretty big names, um, mm. and it basically grew... Um, to a crazy amount. We didn't really expect it ourselves. Um, we're glad it did, but we certainly didn't expect it. So it's fair to say you started the, just the hope to make something fun and then it blossomed. Um, but it's worth saying that, that uh, you did work in the mod community before. This wasn't your first experience. This wasn't your, hey, let's I'm going to learn Blender and make some models. I mean, you've had a reasonably good history with the uh, Trek community before this. Yes, I mean, I started out really with modding in, with Star Trek Bridge Commander. Uh, I started mm. out making hardpoint mods, and eventually I started learning to kit bash models, and which grew into modeling itself. Um, I released a mod for Bridge Commander called the Aftermath mod, and mm. uh, one of the biggest projects I worked with uh, before uh, Armada 3 was Star Trek uh, The Ultimate Universe, or Star Trek Legacy, mm. where I was one of the senior modelers of the team, and I was also responsible for a lot of Enterprise-era stuff and also just some other visual stuff. So that experience really helped me prepare for Armada 3 because you kind of figure out what goes into making a big project like this. Yeah. But uh, despite doing all this, I still couldn't have done it without the very, very talented people of my team. Now, do you guys, i to jump in there. Do you guys start with like drawing out new ship designs or you just start modeling and just kind of do it all on the computer? I personally, uh, both. Hmm. I I sometimes wing it, um, but there's a lot of designs that are based, of course, on older Trek designs. For example, with the Cardassians in Armada 3, okay. we couldn't just reuse the models of the Cardassians from Armada 2. They're of a quality that are, you know, not of this time. So mm -hmm. a lot of it was basically remaking old designs, and some other mm -hmm. ones is really um, just designing our own. I'm, I'm trying to think of some designs we designed our own. Uh, for example, the Cardassian Darheel is one I actually designed myself, uh, which is basically just like, okay, 
I'm going to take some elements of the Cardassian Hutet from the Minion Wars, and I'm going to slap this all together and take some Cardassian elements. But, um, my personal goal always with making a new ship, especially for existing races, is that um, it needs to feel that it belongs to hmm. the race that you're making it. There are certain elements always in designs and certain styles that you see appearing that you know you're gonna that keep coming back. For example, mm. with the Cardassian ships, a lot of it is angular, but they're still round and roundness. Mm -hmm. um, but however, you would never see a Cardassian really with bent wings. I mean, the only exception really is the Hideki, but, but it's more of a crab shell kind of shape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the kind of thing you know. That's how I approach it. How some other artists approach it. I know that Michael Wiley, when he designed a Klingon Titan, sort of Kalis, is he? Me and him actually spent a couple of days. Um, Back, going back and forth over some concept art he drew and then he modeled it based off of that. So, I mean, this is obviously a reason why we're talking to you is beyond just the the fact that you've made a mod, you've got this Trek knowledge and Trek experience that, you know, we like to think we, we're sort of the, the guys for and so to bring you on to talk about these designs certainly a fun a fun prospect. Yes, I agree. I mean, uh, knowing about ships and designing them myself has always been uh, kind of really the passion why I really started making them. I mean... Uh, mm. I love designing ships of my own. I'm, I'm, I've got a very outspoken opinion about certain ship designs, but uh, I think anybody oh, who yeah. really loves Trek ships has really strong opinions about certain things yes. when it comes to the designs. So, you know, I particularly am against banana pylons. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, uh, so what, what was your take on how to make a complete game within a game and pushing the envelope of Sins of the Solar Empire? Uh, what have you been trying to create in your own words, and how do you feel that it's gone so far? Um, I feel like it's gone really well. I mean, people think it's gone really well, so I guess I feel it's gone really well. I always try to push it further, um, but the main goal, of course, was trying to make a spiritual successor to Armada 2, and I personally feel we've succeeded, um, not just on like how it sounds and feels, but also how it plays, and just the general language that we use and how to convey things in the game. Um, I mean, of course, there are limits with the game engine, but yeah, like I said, the real goal was to make a spiritual successor um, to Armada 2. Um, and we ended up including a, th a lot of more things from older games as well. I mean, with the newest expansion we're working on, the Final Frontier, they're going to encounter the Kessok from Bridge Commander, completely revamped and looking like brand new, like you've never seen them before. Very nice. um, you've got, um, what else? You've got the Rakeli from Starfleet Command 3 and some other ships from Starfleet Command 3 showing up. Any Lyrans and in the current or Hydrans version of from uh, Starfleet Command uh, 1? Not from for this mod, but for a future mod that we might talk about soon, um, there good, definitely will good. be other races from that universe, from the SFB universe. Um, nice. But for example, again, the Unity Starbase, which is in the current release, is a direct link to Starfleet Command 3. Uh, the Unity Starbase, which was beautifully remodeled by um, one of our artists, uh, who goes by Amagosa or uh, nice. Chris Knight on, um, online. He did some really amazing work. Also, the Typhon class from Star Trek Invasion. Um, which is a lesser known game but I mean he did an amazing job of bringing that ship to modern graphics and mm. making it look you know pretty much as close to you see it in cinematic quality I mean that's saying something mm. but it, you know it's worth you know, making people really understand this is not it is not an official game so you've not got a full uh, studio behind you it's not a, a game start from scratch built with a, a fresh engine you are building a game within a game Tell us what are the actual challenges. You know, how do you? I mean, are you converting everything? Are you rebuilding everything? Are you, you know, just sticking a new sticker over something else and saying this is now our ship? I mean, how do you, how do you make it feel so fresh and yet it is a game within a game? How do you actually make that? Right. Well, one of the things that helps, of course, is the foundation of the game that you're building on really works with what you're trying to achieve. I mean, Sins mm -hmm. of a Solar Empire is a good strategy game and a good ship combat game to begin with. Uh, now, on top of that, that game is very easily moddable, so you can do a lot of things with it. So, but we basically do is we rip out everything about the game and basically start from nothing. So, I mean, huh. you've got the fundamental workings of the game, like, you know, how planets work, how ships work, how they fly, etc., and how mm. the game is structured. Um, however, you completely put that everything in a, in, a, in a Trek jacket, so to say. You know, you basically put a Trek skin on top of it. Um, and then we build a lot of models and we put them in the game, you know, and we make new weapon effects, sound effects, shield effects. Um, when we got some other models from older games, I mean, we, for example, we've got some Klingon and Romulan ships from uh, Star Trek Legacy. But a lot of it is handcrafted by our modelers. I mean, completely new interface, new buttons, sounds, um, particle effects, explosions, photon torpedoes, tetrion disruptors, whatever you can think of. Most of it is crafted by our artists. That's cool. And so is that, I mean, how difficult is that? Is that just a case of a few hours of work or is there R&D? Is there pushing? I mean, is there anything actually added to the game, at least the previous version, the one that's already out? 
is there anything you did to the game that it literally could not do until you made it to do it somehow? Um, I've got a perfect example for that. That would be the multi-vector assault mode. Um, we really cheated to get that working. Now, the, in the game, you'd think that the ship, the Prometheus, actually splits into three parts. Yeah. But it doesn't. Not really. We trick the game into thinking it does. So what we do is we actually make the original ship invisible and then we spawn three separate ships exactly in its place. And funnily enough, because you spawn them directly on top of each other, they kind of slide apart, which makes it seem like, you know, they're separating. And if one of the part is heavily enough damaged or dies, um, they despawn all of them, and the original ship kind of reappears with sort of a, a particle effect, where it seems like it's coming out of warp and reappearing and reattaching itself. Hmm. So, like, stuff, things like that, we cheat with the game. Hmm. And that was one thing you, I'm sure you really wanted to put in because... Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, these all... Uh, we've talked to you before about this sort of offline and, and it does sound like you've tried to make it feel as continuity-driven, as, as real, as, as... You know, I mean, there's, there's a great example where, you know, I'm playing the game randomly and the whale probe comes in and I'm like, wait, what? First time, just like, oh, what? What? And it's amazing. And then I'm just like, well, I'm dead. <laughs> you know? There'd be no whales here. Go away. <laughs> there's tips to kill that thing, you know. There's ships... But when specifically it specifically tailored for that. But when it attacks your main base, and you've only got two other spawn places, you've got not enough money to build ships, and just and then the Borg arrive. It's like I was not in a good way. I was not in a good way in that battle. Yeah, just wait for the next update where planet killers can actually destroy your planets. Oh great! Thank you so much, Max. <laughs> Things but we to look forward to. Yeah, we <laughs> have we have tuned down the um, game enders events, but we will be seeing a lot of new events. I mean, there's this, you know, there's that nice TNG episode with the people with the 80s hair that appear with the ship with the glowing ball. Oh. <laughs> okay. So that will appear, and there's going to be asteroid strikes Ooh. and some other cool stuff that will work. But, you know, you can kill the asteroid. Is there a... Is there some, I know in the game, um, there are obviously stars, and in the start of the generations, they blow up a star. Are you having the Amagosa repository and blowing, you know, that'd be cool, blow up a star, and then... Um, well, cool. most of the game usually is focused around a single star, with exception to multi-star maps. Right. So killing off an entire star would really be detrimental to gameplay. We have something in the works in okay. forms of maybe a solar flare or two, okay. um, but nothing really as extreme as like a supernova. <laughs> yes, I guess the scale, even though it looks in the game so small... Would be game-breaking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. mm, interesting. Um, so... Do you want to talk to us about something Trekyard's fans obviously love? The ships. There are... H how many ships in the game? What? 150? 200? Uh, I mean, I'd say we're closer to four, 500. Well, no. That, that's the new version, I assume, with all the add-ons. The... Well, even the original... The, the one... The Call to Arms it did release. I can check approximately how many ships there are. I mean, just the fact that I guessed 250 and you went four is already impressive, just without knowing the exact... Ah, uh, well... Right now, in terms of model files, we've got 796 model files in the game. I actually just checked. That does include new planets, though, so take off about... I mean, the planets in total, plus the asteroids, are about 100, 200 with the debris, so about 500 ships in total, ships and stations. So I'm impressed. Are you impressed, Stuart? <laughs> I'm very impressed. I need to start playing this game now. You do! I, I, tell, you, I tell you every other week. Um, but, I mean, you sort of approached it before, but... Just that number, that is so many, so many, so many ships. Are these models, are any of the models from previous games, because there's a plethora of games out there, did you build every single one yourself, your team, and tell us how much work actually goes into a ship from scratch, at this All quality, right. obviously. All right, well, there are some models that are not built by us. For example, we have some Klingon and Romulan ships which come from Star Trek Legacy. Their models looked good enough, and basically it is really time-consuming to build a ship. But there are really a lot of models built by either our team directly or models that we've got permission to use from the mm. community. There's a really talented guy in the Armada 2 community, back when Armada 2 files was still a thing, because Filefront shut them all down. Um, his name was Ad Mormon. He was a Dutch guy just like me. He built a, nice, a really nice amount of ships, and we um, contacted him and got permission to use his models. Um, and we retextured a lot of them. For example, Sir, the Klingon Scout is a model of his, and I retextured that. Um, however, again, a lot of them are built by our team, and... I mean, you basically start out with a cube in 3D space and you build it, mold it until it's a starship. Then you, um, I mean, I, I don't know if any of you guys ever built a cube out of paper. Mm -hmm. Well, if you build a cube out of paper, you have to fold it. But you can't really draw on it when it's, you can't draw a picture on it if it's like already assembled. So you have to flatten it. 
that's what you do with this 3D model as well. You kind of make sure that the entire model is on a flat plane, so you can import it in Photoshop and put your textures on it. So you know you can draw your windows, your registries, your warp grills, and then you import it into game to into the game whatever specifications you might need. But, I mean, if I were to explain all that, that we'd need three separate videos for that. So there's actually some videos online that show me doing it. So. Mm-hmm. How much time does it take to make an average model? I mean, take take a ship we know and love, and how long do you think it's taken you to to make it? To so just to give just to give an idea of time, because you know it sounds amazing, but are we talking two, five, ten, a hundred hours? Um, well, the Cardassian Galore, which is when I really put hmm. time in, depending on the amount of detail I, I put in it. Uh, if I'm crazy, I can get like five ships done in a weekend, but oh, wow. then I'm really crazy. Um, like your average ship takes about a day, day and a half. Hmm. Cool. And that's like the ships which have good references. If it's a ship which has crappy references, you're going to take a bit longer. <laughs> Just like a Trekyards episode. Yay. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and I remember one thing we talked about uh, previously off off the um, off, off the Skype is that, you know, there's a certain level of detail that's in the show, and especially in the motion pictures, you know, the, the Enterprise E3 model is, is glorious. Everything's physical. You know, all the windows exist, the facades exist, uh, all, all the hull plates, and it's all physical. Enterprise NX-01, great example. This is a game engine that is certainly a few old, for a few years old now, and you've got to deal with people's graphics abilities, their hardware, a wide variety, and it's got to be able to render possibly 100, 200 chips in one thing. So what sort of detail level <laughs> do you actually do? And tell us some actual cheats that, that we've heard you do, but what, what you tell us some cheats? All right, so um, one of the things we do is, uh, for when the models exist out of polygons, and it, uh, an average mo- polygon mo- model for a show, can usually go up into the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of polygons. Mm-hmm. Our ships use about 10, 10 to 20,000. 20,000 is really the most, which is really the high-detailed ships. Wow. Now we're talking the Titan-class ships or some other, some hero ships which are extremely detailed, like the Defiant or the, uh, the Enterprise, mm-hmm. you know. Um, then there's a lot of tricks to fake depth in 3D models. There's in the game engine, there's this technique called bump mapping, which basically allows you to define height in a 2D texture and the game engine will kind of render that out as if it were 3D, uh, while it technically is flat, which allows you to give you a lot of detail where there technically isn't really on the model. Mm. That's one of the ways we cheat. And of course, the game engine has some really good lighting, which does help. Cool. Now, do you want to talk us through the latest release of Armada 3, uh, or the latest patch? What new features, improvements, and things can we expect for what's coming up well, the road? Well, what's coming up? It's called the Final Frontier, and I mean, the last two expansions really focused. The last expansion we focused on adding the Dominion, mm. which was a really mm. big point for us because you really wanted to do that right. I mean, we wanted to give you the full Dominion War experience. However, the Final Frontier kind of goes back to its TNG roots, mm. where it's more about exploration and encountering strange new things. So, for one, what we did is we revamped the planetary system completely. You now have about 70 new planet types you can discover. Mm. From you know your class D planet, like class D is a planetoid where we've got about five six varieties. You've got your dilithium moon, you've got a ice moon, etc. And then there's like a completely new amount of planets. There's a bunch of gas giants, um, but that's just one of the things. And we uh, we added a lot more events that can happen in the game. So no longer just your web web or will probe that shows up, um, or doomsday machines. You've got other things like maybe. Um, there's Ferengi traders that show up instead of mm. Ferengi attackers. Um, or maybe, like I said, the Telerian Tar- plague ship, um, random Maki raids, uh, mm. and the things like that. And also just new things you can discover. So you could discover a abandoned regular outpost that you can capture, which would boost your research. Or a um, you can actually encounter an empty Nor station that you can capture as a Federation. Mm. I remember when I played the game, you know, a, a thing they include is artifacts, you know, you can just, yes. you can search plants. And I was always very disappointed in the lack of interest in that because, you know, you search most plants, you sometimes, very rarely get one and it gives a very small boost. You know, I'd certainly love to see your, the same thing, but for you guys, you know, those nine slots, whatever, actually is a useful, genuine thing. You know, one gives you, you know, one is discovering a blade of armor, suddenly all your intrepids get a blade of armor. I and mean, something really physical, you know, or firewall cloaked, suddenly your defiant can... You know, things that, that add something or change the game or even, you know, uh, mirror universe, dimensionality, <laughs> transporter, beam, transporter, and suddenly well, now you can get mirror universe ships, you know. That'd be fun well, if those things were already um, added a lot of them. We already added a lot of new um, anomalies in the game by default. Mm. I mean, we, for example, you know, have Takan weapons array or things like that, or you can have, uh, you can find the preserver archive. But 
the limitation of the game engine within the artifacts is really high, so we can basically only add percentual changes. We right. can't really add physical changes. However, some of the things that really give, like, really interesting things, you know, for example, you can find Foth uh, warp coils or a crashed Foth mm. ship, which give you a warp drive boost because they have transwarp technology, except for example. And we really did a lot with that. However, we are going to expand a lot on the planetary bonuses you can find. So you could find a thing on a planet, which will give you a bonus to that planet. So, um, like, it can go as bad as, you know, freaking volcanic eruptions to um, um, psychedelic spores, which make your people breed like ba- like rabbits. Happens that occasionally. Sounds interesting. Another day at the office for Starfleet, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That's the Wednesday uh, for you. I have one last quick question. Now, you say you, you already used the Sins of the Solar Empire like basic game. Now, would you ever consider doing something from scratch game-wise instead of, you know, cheating? Or, like, you can tailor it to your own own will that way if you create it from the ground up, yes? Or is that too much, too involved? Buying an engine um, and just doing it from scratch, yeah. Well, we tried something with the Unreal Engine, but we really couldn't get it launching because getting programmers is hard and getting mm. actual coders is really hard. Okay. Without any funds. And if you're going to do a Star Trek game, um, we didn't want to risk doing crowdfunding, especially in the light of the um, what happened to Axanar. And we just basically didn't want to risk that. Um, basically, we, did, we don't even take donations at this point. Uh, we mm. were considering doing it, and we might do it because we just changed our name to our company. We're actually calling ourselves Stellar Parallax Productions now. So, cool. um, But we still haven't really got any funds. And, you know, if you got, don't have any funds, I mean, we're just doing this in our free time, and doing mm-hmm. it on, off of an existing game engine is... Uh, for us, it's a lot more doable. Well, hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, I think fundamentally what I get from this is that you want to make something for the community. I mean, people, people like you know us three, we're not here to make content for ourselves. We're here to make content for you guys. And the enjoyment is in the fun result, is in the people, you know, people can enjoy it. And especially with the you know, Trek episodes are great. Everyone loves Trek Yards. But the fact that I can spend 300 hours blowing things up and then not blowing things up and then wub wubbing, I mean, you know, it's, it's just... That is that is a legacy that I hope I hope people really appreciate the work you put into, and the iterative work. And we've talked before. Every time you catch me on Skype, you say, "Oh, I've retextured this model." I'm like, "Okay, good. Yeah, that looks way better, Max. You spent another few hours. Why have you done that?" You know, you keep telling me that. So it, people need to really understand the amount of hours. And if it's free time, you know, luckily we do track cars part time and full time for me. So this is the gig, mm. but as a free time entity and looking so professional is incredible. You know, so well done. I from- yeah, thank you. I recently just got a full time job, so you know it's. I and I've already really had like the last couple of months. I really had a job that basically was pretty much full time. So we all really do this in our free time. All of our team members do, um, and we just do it because it's a work of passion. Yeah. And I mean, I've got a really, really talented team. I've got a lot of people that really help us out. I mean, you can find a full team on the, on my DB. You can find us there. But um, I really, I really need to say that I couldn't have done this without these guys. I mean, I. I I owe them uh, our success. I owe them my success as, you know, to this entire project. I couldn't have done it without. Couldn't, couldn't have done it without them. Cool. Yes. Um, but I, 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 I want to applause to your team. Yes. I want, I want to scoot back one minute. You just talk about the passion for a second again. You know, one thing that Star Trek, while you might say it is, really it isn't. It's not about the conflict. It's not about the ship battles. It really isn't. But obviously. Uh, uh, any video game has to have a, a game mechanic, and unfortunately, most of the time that's battle. So Armada Three is very much, you know, I, in one game of Armada, I've killed more people, I've had more people killed than the entire Dominion War. Sometimes, you know, it's pretty dramatic. So just, just saying, uh, we want to highlight this this new expansion we've talked about before: discovery, exploration, making the world of the game feel like a livable or a living, breathing world with things going on. I'm yes. so happy to hear that because it pushes the game into something. It's not just, you know, uh, the way I think of Armada is, you know, you, uh, uh, Sins is you build a fleet, you go to another planet, conquer it, conquer it, Kill conquer everyone it. until the Arrest is dead. Yeah, that, that's the game. And so please just, I mean, re- reiterate how you're trying to expand that because you touched on it, but I think, what do you want the game, the final version to be, um, in your own words? Well, as much as I'd like it, it's still going to be a lot about the killing. Um <laughs> It's not very Starfleet of me. Protecting protecting your planets. There you go. Yeah, and gaining other ones because we needed your resources. I had an empire to protect. Well, there you go. That's my favorite Cardassian leader. He's a hero mm. to me. Goldar Heel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but there's going to be a lot more civilian effects to it. There's going to be more civilian travel around. There's going to be more travel trading with other minor races um, and just a lot of more discovery 
actual bonuses towards uh, ex you know exploration. There's going to be in total, you're going to see less capturable planets, but there's going to be more interesting anomalies and things you can find to do with them. I mean, one of the things you can find now is, for example, the Argus Array, mm. Mm. which all they all have, all have an interesting function and they all do something new and interesting in the game. That's how we're trying to expand it. It's it's less about just I need that planet, I need that planet. So we're yeah. like, okay, let's see what's mm. let's see what's out there. Let's see what's out there. Yeah. <laughs> so I have one last question then. Um, what is your favorite model you've done? And what was your favorite feature that you've brought to this game? And then we'll close up. My favorite model. And let's say released one, so people can know. The yeah, okay, released about. one. All right. Um, my favorite released one has to be a ship, ship that I did. I'd have to say my Norway class, because it's one of the ships you <laughs> haven't really seen at all, ever. You just see it in that two scenes in first contact. Yeah. 3D model was lost, so it was a lot of interpretation from a lot of sources. And the favorite feature we got working, in my opinion... Um, has to do with the multi-vector assault mode, and it's when the USS Voyager dies, it's the cells pivot up with the appropriate sound and all. I've, I've got a thing for the Intrepid class. I don't know what it is, but I don't like Captain Schizophrenia, but I do love the ship. <laughs> all right, well, on that note, Whew. that is it, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today, Max. I know the Commander has played quite a bit of this mod, and it is great to actually be able to sit down with you and kind of get a sense of what actually goes into a project like this. A lot goes into making something when you want to make it the best it can be, mm -hmm. which we do here at Trek Yards, of course. And it's clear you have the same passion for your work. So from all the fans out there, I offer you a very big thank you. All right, yeah, but it's, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, receiving this kind of reception, I mean, and this, you know, getting to so many people, it's... I mean, you know, you guys know what it's like, but I mean, it's a really amazing experience to know to to have, you know, to get people like John Eve's comment on a model of one of your teammates that they did, and, and one of my models as well, the Dominion battleship, saying it's like that's amazing. That was like one of the most flattering moments I have ever had. So yeah, it's think, it's an amazing experience. I think one of the things we're realizing is that you know we're we're in the middle of it, so we don't see it as everyone else sees it. So you're there spending a weekend building models, and then. Oh look, ten thousand hours have been played that weekend because hundreds of people are playing the you know playing the thing. We're getting a you know a million minutes watched in a week. People mm -hmm. are enjoying the, our content, and but here we are working on it. And it's it's sometimes nice to be able to step back. So you come on our show, we say, hey, it's amazing, and and for you to then like you get that step, you get that perspective of, of saying, hey, it's amazing. You know, um, I think we want to take that step back occasionally. Yeah. And that is it. <laughs> Check out the mod page if you want to play some of the sexiest ship battles out there and download it and go to steam and buy sins of Solar empire because we do not by any means endorse piracy so come on guys peep some stupid people have commented on the page where can i get it it's like just buy it it's cheap it's amazing you get hours the, f the game the mods free the game's cheap go buy it support them because Plus, the game is on sale plenty of times and we <laughs> usually advertise that on our mod db page as well when it is so very specifically go buy it support support max by supporting them mm -hmm. And it is worth that for your Xbox, believe me. So thanks so much, Max. I look forward to talking to you again on many, many topics. All right. Uh, All right. I'm going to enjoy that too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. This is Captain Foley. Commander Coggins. And Max here. And we will see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.